Yeah, so unfortunately, uh, Bob could not be here today due to flight cancellations in the Northeast. Um, but Tal is here, um, and I'm excited for the chance to present this work. So first, to give kind of a roadmap of how this talk is going to work, I'll first give a very brief um, zoomed out perspective on the legacy of syntactic structures and on the legacy of perceptrons. And then for most of the talk, I'll zoom in on our specific case study of question formation in English. So first, for the le legacy of syntactic structures, there's one aspect of the, this legacy that is most relevant to the work I'll be discussing, which is the insight that the patterns of human language are best represented by a formal computational system, i.e. a grammar. And the types of grammars that are powerful enough to represent the properties of human language are the transformational grammars, um, because the types of formalisms lower in the Chomsky hierarchy do not have enough power to express the patterns in language. Um, and in fact, transformational grammars are probably too powerful, but I'm not really going to get into the different types of context-sensitive formalisms here. Um, the important point for what I'm going to discuss is that even with the very powerful representational formalism, such as transformational grammar, there still may be constraints on the possible grammars that a human language learner would learn when acquiring language um, because of some sort of inductive bias. So specifically, Chomsky argued that um, when looking at the patterns in human language, these patterns can be more simply explained by structure-sensitive rules than non-structure-sensitive linear-based rules. Um, and so the relative simplicity of these different rules could introduce some inductive bias that would constrain the types of grammars that could be learned. So now for the legacy of perceptrons. So in the theory of perceptrons, cognition is represented in terms of mappings between subsymbolic gradient representations. And the exact functions learned by a perceptron are learned via minimizing the loss using gradient descent. So given this learning algorithm, the um, inductive bias of the algorithm is determined by the shape of the error surface on the loss function, and also perhaps by the network archi architecture. Now, the exact nature of that bias is very opaque and not well understood, but one thing we can be pretty confident of is that it is not a bias relative to um, whether the rules are structure sensitive or not. So given that fact, perceptrons might be a useful tool um, for addressing these questions of whether an innate structure sensitive bias needs to be present in a language learner or not. Okay, so now I'm going to zoom in on the case study of question formation in English. So you consider a simple English declarative sentence like my dog can sneeze. If you want to turn that into a yes or no question, you take the main auxiliary verb and move it to the front to get can my dog sneeze. But if you imagine that you're a child language learner, as I'm sure most of you probably were at some point, um, <laughs> there are multiple possible hypotheses for rules that could generate this correct output. Um, so first, there's the correct hypothesis, which is that the right way to form this question is to parse the input sentence and then move the main auxiliary um, to the top of the tree. But there are other hypotheses that would also generate that same question, such, such as just looking at the linear order of the words in the sentence, like beads on a string, and taking the first auxiliary you find and putting it at the front. Now, there are examples that would disambiguate these two hypotheses. Um, so the classic example sentence is, the man who is tall is happy. So if you consider first the structure-sensitive tree-based um, prediction, it would predict the, the correct question, is the man who is tall happy? Whereas the linear rule would predict the, the question, is the man who tall is happy? So, however, even though such examples would disambiguate the two hypotheses, um, Chomsky argues that kids do not encounter such examples. And so, um, with that argument of, in mind, Chomsky makes a very famous claim called the argument from the poverty of the stimulus, which I'll break down into four points as follows. So the first point, which is uncontroversial, is that kids learn the structure-sensitive generalization about question formation. Um, and then the second point, which is Chomsky's claim at least, is that the disambiguating examples do not occur in the input from which the language learners are learning the language. And the next claim is that Without such disambiguating examples, it is impossible to learn the correct structure central sensitive generalization. And therefore, point number four follows from those other three, namely that kids must have an inductive bias for hierarchical structure in order to have the learning patterns that we observe. 
Now, at this point, I should note that there are many constructions other than question formation that afford an interesting perspective on the poverty of the stimulus. <coughs> um, here, we're only answering or analyzing question formation, um, but in future work, we would like to look at other um, transformations and constructions. Um, now, many people have um, argued against this um, argument from the poverty of the stimulus. For example, many people have argued with point number two and have looked at, say, the childless corpus of, said that actually relevant examples do occur. Um, but in this work, we're focusing on point number three, the claim that without those disambiguating examples, it would be impossible to learn the correct generalization. Because you can imagine it being the case that there are other cues in the input that would bias you towards the correct generalization, even though there might not be direct evidence for it. Um, and perhaps perceptrons, or more generally neural networks, would be a useful tool for um, teasing this apart um, because, as I said before, it doesn't seem that they have a bias towards the structure sensitivity. Um, so there has been some prior work on using neural networks to um, model the acquisition of syntactic properties. So one of the earliest ones was Elman, 1991, showed that recurrent networks um, can properly learn subject-verb agreement in a word prediction task, um, even when there may be intervening content, such as the relative cause in this example. So it correctly predicts that boy needs to agree with chases. Um, and so that was with a very small artificial grammar, but recently that those results were reproduced by um, Lindsay Dupu and Goldberg, 2016, on more naturalistic input. Um, so that's with the question of subject-verb agreement, but on our specific task of the question formation via subject auxiliary inversion, uh, Lewis and Elman, 2001, used a similar setup as their previous work um, to argue that recurrent networks can learn to correctly predict whether a question is well-formed or ill-formed when subject for, or subject auxiliary inversion has been involved. Um, however, those results have later been called into question. Um, but then in 2007, uh, Bob Frank and Don Mathis pointed out that perhaps we shouldn't be thinking of question formation as predicting the well-formedness of a question but rather as a transformation from a declarative sentence into a question, which was in fact how I first presented this task. Um, so Frank and Mathis created a type of network that they called a transformational network, um, which involved a recurrent network that was trained to take um, each word of a declarative input sentence one word at a time, and then receive a special token signaling the end of the input sentence, which was the network signal to then begin outputting a question one word at a time. Um, so as a historical note, this network was based on the work of Bachmannick and Plough, um, and it's very similar to modern sequence-to-sequence -sequence networks, which were reinvented by Sutskever et al. in 2014, um, with some differences. Um, so the results from Frank and Mathis 2007 did have some very intriguing properties. Um, so what this graph is going to show is the network's been given the input of the declared descendants, the boy with the senator does love the lizard, um, which should be producing this output question. So what I'll show now is the probability distribution over the possible output words at each time step of producing the output. So first, the network's very confident that the first word should be does and the. Then it's a little confused between boy and a similar lexically similar word, senator. Um, you know, so it gets a bit confused about part of speech, but in general, it's predicting the correct word or at least a different word um, in the same general word class. So this is a sentence where um, there's only one auxiliary in the input. Um, and it doesn't have any problem with that. However, if we instead look at a question where there is a relative clause on the input sentence, um, then the network struggles much more. So it starts out doing okay, so it predicts does, a, singular noun, but then once it gets to where the relative clause should be, um, it really gets confused. It just kind of deletes the entire relative clause and then produces two periods at the end. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, and so there, are, um, so like I said, the work of Frank and Mathis was very intriguing, but also kind of a mixed bag and a bit hard to interpret, um, which is understandable because they were doing this before sequence to sequence networks were really a thing. So the jumping off point for our current work is to conduct similar experiments, um, but with the power of modern sequence to sequence networks and with all the bells and whistles that have been invented since Frank and Mathis's 2007 work. Um, so here's the model we'll be using, which is a sequence to sequence neural network with attention um, if you're not a machine learn learning person, the exact details of this are not important, but one thing I do want to draw your attention to is that we trained 100 different networks that all have the same architecture, but that differ only in their random initialization. 
And the reason we did this was that we wanted to make sure that whatever results we got were not just a fluke about one single network, but rather that they generalized um, properly. Um, and this network was trained based on a language where the input was always a simple English declarative sentence. So the sentence could have an intransitive verb, such as the walrus can sneeze, a transitive verb, the walrus can entertain your jackalope. Um, noun phrases can have modifiers, such as a prepositional phrase, um, or a relative clause. And specifically, relative clauses can occur on the subject of the sentence or on the object. And one important thing to note is that a given noun phrase can have at most one relative clause. So we constrain the depth of recursion here to be just one. Um, and so overall, the vocab size is 66, so you know, pretty small vocab. Now, um, there are two different types of tasks that we ask the network to perform, namely identity and question formation. And the task that is to be performed is indicated by the final token to the input. So for example, if the input is the walrus can sneeze ident, that ident tells the network that now when it begins outputting, it should be performing the identity task, which is simply reproducing the exact input sentence that was given. Whereas the question formation task is indicated by the token quest at the end of the input, which tells the network that it should now output the question version of the sentence, um, can the walrus sneeze? So given that grammar and those tasks, um, there are three basic relevant types of sentences. There are sentences without relatives, which are the simplest case. Um, so given the without relative sentence, the dog can visit my yak, here's what the ident output should look like, and here's what the question output should look like. So those are very straightforward. Then there are sentences where there's a relative clause attached to the object of the sentence, such as this example, the dog who can visit my, the dog can visit my yak, who will yawn? So in this case, that's what the ident should look like, still very straightforward. But then that's what the question should look like, um, where you need to move the first auxiliary to the front to get, can the dog visit my yak, who will yawn? And the final type of relevant sentence is questions where there's a relative clause on the subject. So the dog, who will yawn, can visit my yak. So again, there's what the ident output should look like, and there's what the question output should look like. Um, so now there are these six types of combinations of sentence type and task. And the network, when it's trained, um, does ne never sees this final combination of um, a sentence with a relative clause in the subject and the question task. So we hold that out. And that's relevant because this is the only one of the six cases that disambiguates those two hypotheses I mentioned before. So without having seen those types of sentences, the network has no direct evidence to disambiguate those two hypotheses. Um, so now I'll discuss the results with that setup. So first, I'll consider only the uh, novel sentences where the sentence itself is novel, but it's not a novel structure, that it's, it's the, not the held out um, type of sentence. There are no relative clauses on the subject. And in these cases, the networks perform very well. On average, across the 100 networks, they get 97.5% accuracy on predicting the output sentence exactly right. So pretty clearly, the networks are doing a good job of learning the types of sentences that they've been exposed to. But now when we move to the um, held out sentence structure, accuracy plummets to 2.4%, which is very low. Um, but note that our main interest here is in whether the network can identify the correct auxiliary to move or not. Um, whereas getting the entire sentence right requires getting a whole bunch of other things right as well. Um, so for now, four sentences with the held out structure, we're going to first analyze just accuracy on getting the first word of the output. And I'll motivate that further in a second. Um, and then later we'll come back and analyze the errors um, to kind of get some sense of why it's getting such a low accuracy and getting the entire sentence right. Um, so why is it okay to focus <coughs> on just the first word? Well, if you consider a sentence of the held out type, such as the dog who will yawn can visit my yak, here are the predictions that the two, two different hypotheses would make. So the structure sensitive hypothesis would predict the question, can the dog who will yawn visit my yak? Whereas the linear hypothesis would predict, will the dog who yawn can visit my yak? And you'll notice that if we ignore everything but the first word, the two hypotheses still make different predictions. Um, so we can still get some insight about the differences between the two hypotheses just by looking at the first word. So here are the results on just the first word. So what we did for each of the 100 networks we trained was we measured whether the network was more likely to um, put the second auxiliary, auxiliary, which is the correct one, at the start versus the first auxiliary. And it turns out that 
of the 100 networks had the correct preference, whereas only 13 had the incorrect one, which is significantly better than chance. Now, just looking at this table, you might worry, OK, so 87 of them have the correct preference, but is it like a 51%, 49% preference, or is it really a clear preference? Um, so to tease that apart, what we also did was for each of these networks, we took the percent of times it chose the correct auxiliary minus the percent of times it chose the incorrect one. And here's a histogram of those differences. So the red line is at zero, which is the difference that would be predicted by chance. Um, and you can see that most of the networks had a difference that was um, well above that chance baseline of zero, you know, a difference of 0.5 or greater. Um, so these networks really do seem to be learning a pretty strong preference. So now the question arises, why does it, why do the networks have this preference for learning the structural um, hypothesis? And as we discussed before, it's almost certainly not a bias in the network itself. Therefore, it, it really must be the case that somehow the hierarchical na nature of the language we're training on um, allows the network to infer um, that it is a hierarchical structure. And so um, given this explanation, it's kind of natural to ask, well, what would happen if we added even more cues to hierarchical structure in the input language? So that's what we do in a second experiment, where we create a new language that's identical to the first one, except that um, whereas the original language used the four auxiliaries can, will, could, and would, now we change the auxiliaries to do, does, don't, and doesn't. And the reason this is relevant is because before there was no agreement. Any subject could go with any auxiliary because the auxiliaries were all modals. But now every auxiliary must agree with its subject. That is, do and don't can only appear with a plural subject, and does and doesn't can only appear with a singular subject. So now if we go back to those results in predicting the first word, here are the results again from the language without agreement. And now here are the results from the language with agreement. So you can see that with agreement, there is an even stronger preference than before um, for learning the correct um, auxiliary to put at the front. And then here's the histogram from before, and now the histogram from the with agreement network, which you can see is shifted to the right, which is the correct direction. OK, so I said before that we were going to forget about full sentences, but now I'll come back to those, because there is certainly interesting stuff to be found there as well. So like I said, the networks very rarely get the entire sentence right. So it's natural to ask, what sort of errors are they making? And in particular, how do these errors compare to the errors that children make when they're acquiring question formation? Um, so this comparison was inspired by Crane and Nakayama in 1987, who formed a typology of the types of errors that children make um, when acquiring question formation. Um, so there are a lot of types of errors you can imagine making. So given the declarative input sentence, the dog who will yawn can visit my yak, um, there's the correct question you could output. There's also the type of error we've already discussed where you move the first auxiliary instead of the second one. But you could also imagine perhaps um, putting the right auxiliary at the front but failing to delete it from within the sentence, um, or putting the right auxiliary at the front but then deleting the incorrect auxiliary, or perhaps you could take some random auxiliary that didn't even appear in the sentence and plop it on the front. Um, and then you could also imagine, of course, there's an infinity of you know, weird random garbled things that could come out. Um, so we're not going to analyze the weird random garbled things. Um, instead, we'll just look at the ones that we'll classify as interpretable, which I'll define here. So it turns out that, on average, each network had 65% of its outputs being interpretable. And what I mean by interpretable is we decompose the task of question formation into two subcomponents. Um, first, putting an auxiliary at the start of the question, and then second, deleting an auxiliary from within the sentence. Um, so there are three possibilities for which auxiliary you could delete. You could delete the first one, the second one, or neither of them. And then there are also three possibilities for which auxiliary you put at the start. You could put the first auxiliary at the front, the second one, or some other random one that wasn't in the sentence. Um, and so this table shows the nine possible cases of this. And I'll focus in on the two cells that have noticeably the highest values. So the first is this type of error, where um, the network um, puts the correct second auxiliary at the front of the question, but then does not delete anything from the input. So for example, given the input, the dog, who will yawn, can visit my yak. This error would predict, can the dog, who will yawn, can visit my yak. And this is interesting because it's a type of error that, as you can see, the network makes pretty often. Um, and it's also one of the most common mistakes that, child, that children will make. Um, so that's cool. In this case, it seems like the networks are erring in similar ways as kids. But then if we look at the other really common type of error here, where the correct auxiliary is put at the front, um, 
but then the incorrect one is deleted. This is one that the networks make very often, but that kids really never make at all. Um, and you know that's not surprising. This is a very kind of alien-looking mistake to make. Can the dog who yawned can visit my yak? Um, so that's also interesting. Okay, so there are a lot of directions this could be taken, and I think one of the most important things that we want to pursue um, is moving beyond a Tory grammar to go on to the actual type of input that language learners are exposed to, namely by training on the childish corpus. So we started working on that. It's a bit hard because given the much larger vocab of the childish corpus, um, the network just has trouble getting the correct words. So we're looking into using some sort of copying mechanism to deal with that. Um, okay, so conclusions. Um, it seems that contemporary neural networks are able to um, identify, pretty reliably identify the correct auxiliary to move even without agreement. And then when agreement cues are present, the networks um, do even better. So this suggests that the language itself provides evidence for hierarchical structure, so it might not be necessary to be born with an inductive bias in order to learn this construction. But again, I should add the important caveats that we can't really make conclusions about actual language acquisition until we work, look at something like childess rather than the, the toy grammar. And also we should make it clear that we can't make claims about um, whether an inductive bias is necessary for other constructions, because here we only look at question formation. I think the final takeaway here is that neural networks can be a useful tool for testing what generalizations can be learned from the data alone versus which ones require the data plus some inductive bias. Thank you. We have eight minutes for questions. Hey, Tom, nice to talk. Uh, Chris Dyer again uh, from uh, DMind. But I used to work with Tom when he was a hundred, uh, high school student. Uh, so, uh, great to see you. Uh, I want to push, uh, as a machine learning person, on this idea that there is no inductive bias in a recurrent neural network. That is not a very fair way of saying it, because there's no learning without inductive bias. The uh, right. characterizing the nature of the inductive bias that's present in a recurrent neural network is hard. And it's something I'll talk about in my talk yeah. uh, tomorrow, because that's what I'm very interested in. So I would sort of uh, encourage you to, I, I think what you're finding is very interesting, but uh, I wouldn't say that RNNs are sort of an example of a learner without inductive bias, because okay. such a thing doesn't uh, really uh, right. exist. Okay. Um, and, uh, but this hypothesis that sort of it's a perforce type effect, and uh, it's like there's sort of this information about hierarchy from these other domains, that's a very interesting right. hypothesis that you should definitely uh, push on. Um, the second thing that uh, I also uh, wanted to uh, very briefly uh, suggest here is uh, what would you make of the result if you took something that Chomsky sort of says is a uh, impossible question formation strategy according to UG, like reduce, like reversing uh, the linear order of, uh, of a sentence right. um, and to form a question. I think RNNs would be very good at learning that. Yeah, they, far they better, are, yeah. far better than this. And so, what would that? How would you reinterpret your results if you were getting like 100% on that? Um, let's see. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and I would need to think about that. So I guess our results here were mainly trying to look at the properties um, of the, lang the types of languages that kids are getting during acquisition. Um, and so we just haven't really been looking at, at, at the types of languages that they wouldn't be getting, such as the reverse reversing the sentences. Um, if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I guess the... I don't know. If, if these learners are so good, like how much can we sort of say they're good models of... Uh, of children if they're so capable of learning completely unchildlike things. Because presumably if parents right. went and talked to their kids by reversing sentences, they would re they would regularize that into right. some UG compatible language like you see with you know, home sign and things like that where parents are right. signing in non-UG ways and the kids still end up with sort of UG compatible sign languages. Right, that's a very good point. Yeah, we should think about that more. Just a quick historical note, um, this issue was raised by Pinker and Prince about string reversals and phonology, and there's a literature on that, and if you look at my paper, I have a summary of that literature. Yeah. <laughs> Please. Yeah. Okay. Um, Lisa from the Irvine, so really interesting work, and maybe following up on Chris's question a little bit, so I was really excited to see the result where you're like, look, we, we reproduced this kid error, and then we reproduced this super weirdo error. Cool. 
Um, so in terms of in understanding what the, and this is the hard part, understanding what the network is actually doing, right? Because you, know, you sort of feel like, oh, wow, it internalizes like structure sensitivity and wait, but it did this so totally weirdo error. So how do you know? Right. Kind of how can we interpret like what it's doing in terms of like the, the cognitive representations? I know this is a hard question. Yeah. Like, or how confident do you feel that it's doing something kid-like because it produced the weird error? Right, yeah, that's a very good question and one that I don't think we have a good answer for yet. Um, yeah. Um. Because one of the things that I think um, I've seen from, from I think, Bob's work on this and, so, and so possibly other people in your group is the cover ways that you can poke the network to kind of see like what it's being sensitive to, if it's right. like, yeah. picking up on like subtle things in the input that you know humans don't pay attention to, yeah. or if it's actually doing something clever. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so there are ways of looking at the internal representations. You know, you can try to do some sort of linear classification on the hidden representations or something like that. We haven't done analyses like that. But, I mean, um, but could you, like, would that be something you could like do and see if it's actually doing something at least partially structuring? Um, yeah, quite possibly. You know, so for example, we might be able to do something like see if we can train a linear classifier on the um, hidden representations to predict whether um, it's going to get the correct output or which type of error it might make for a given input. So that would be interesting. Sharon Goldmark from Edinburgh. So I also thought this was really cool, and I, especially in, in showing that there are these cues for hierarchical structure, even in places that we might not have thought about them. Um, but again, sort of following up on some of these uh, related themes, it kind of makes me wonder, OK, um, so you know, if the hierarchical structure is entirely learnable, uh, why is it that all human languages seem to have that hierarchical structure? Because you would expect that, yeah. you know, there's no particular reason why it should be there. You could just as well have learned something else. Um, right. So I guess this sort of gets back to the question of, like, you know, how does this, it, it, you know, the fact that these networks potentially could learn lots of other things right. also. And so I'm wondering if maybe a, an interesting, um, you know, follow up might be to, to think about, I don't know, you know, iterative learning or something. Like, what, do, they, yeah. do they actually, uh, go off in the direction of something that might be a way of trying to figure out like what kind of biases they actually have. Yeah. Um, yeah. Or something yeah, that's a great point. Jason. Yeah, so this is just a quick response to what uh, Chris and Sharon were asking about. Uh, what, the way that I interpret uh, what you're showing is as a kind of rebuttal to Chomsky's notion that languages look the way they do because otherwise they wouldn't be learnable. Well, okay, they'd be learnable anyway. Uh, right. So maybe they look the way they do because of some other functional constraints that have to do with, say, semantic compositionality or the, uh, the generative process being hierarchical or uh, you know some other kind of functional right. constraints. Uh, I just see this as I don't see it as um, um, I, I don't see that we have to show that only these kinds of languages can be learnable uh, if the point is to undermine the whole notion of learnability as a functional constraint. Right, I think that is a fair way to look at it. Um, yeah. So here's a couple more experiments. Oh, Bill, it's already here. Uh, here's a couple more experiments you might try and might be useful to people with deep learning. Design. So, like, uh, apart from the string reversal that uh, Chris was suggesting, you can get these things that are sort of local string reversals. So you could get uh, cases where you want to map a regular algebraic form to reverse Polish notation. Okay. Those people who used only HP calculators. And um, you know, so that you could do the sequence to sequence transform through those, and there there actually is hierarchical structure that you have to respect in order to do the yeah, correct yeah. transform. And it is like sort of a reversal of portions of the strings, but it's not a total string reversal. And so you could compare its performance across those two different tests to see if the to try and probe the RNN into like what kinds of biases it actually has by trying to get these things that are local reversals, but not a total string reversal. Right. Yeah, so I think that it might be useful to sort of probe these other well-studied you know, formal languages right. uh, yeah. alongside what you're doing with the naturalistic data. Yeah, yeah that's a great idea. Yeah. 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 Yeah.